and uh, since I've arrived in London, a physicist who took a beautiful analogy about the change in the nature of economics being very similar to what we saw as the necessary change in astronomy back at the time of Galileo. And I frequently said I regard economics as a pre-Galilean discipline. And I stick by that. It predates our discovery that the universe did not consist of 55 concentric uh, uh, spherical cylinders surrounding the Earth on which the planets and the stars rotated. But that was the model that we had back in those days of the nature of the motion of the planets. And to explain how we saw the sun move in the sky and how we saw the phases of Venus, that was a model that I, you'll now find astronomers describing as clever but mad. I think it's an extremely accurate way of describing the SGE models and everything neoclassicals do. <laughs> Clever but mad. Now when you see where we've got to, we now have a vision which... I'm using the comet here as the vision of the, the Copernican and the Keplerian vision of how motion actually occurs. There's a dynamic law behind that and it explains everything we see. Comets, to explain comets in the Ptolemaic system, the explanation was that they were atmospheric phenomena. Okay? They couldn't be predicted. So it was a bit of a shock when Halley's Comet came back on cue according to Newton's mathematics. Similar thing for us. Financial crises can't be predicted. Why? Because they can't occur in a Ptolemaic universe, which is where neoclassical economists live. <laughs> so we need to go from this comparative static nonsense that they work on. They, call, they talk about dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models. In my opinion, they're neither dynamic nor general. They're stochastic equilibrium models. So we need to go to, to, a, to a far from equilibrium way of thinking. We need to abandon the vision of capitalism as a barter system. You may recall that at one stage, Paul Krugman referred to me and several other people uh, as, as, money, as, as banking mystics. They are barter mystics. We need to get rid of this nonsense vision that capitalism can be modelled without a banking sector. It's just stupid. About time we said it loudly to them. And I'm not a fan of the behavioural approach. I think behavioural vision has taught us quite a lot of work, and I, of course I appreciate Daniel Kahneman's work uh, immensely. But I think we need to take a structural approach. We don't want to build economics from the ground up with, with uh, bounded rationality rather than infinite rationality. We want to work in a, in a structural way. And that's been the way the post-Keynesian economics has worked throughout its history. And I think you'll see the classics of the Marx, to some extent the Hayek's, Schumpeter, Keynes and Minsky all had a, a structural, institutional view of capitalism out of which the complexity that they described emerged. And we can do that with modern complex system mathematics. So again, I'll disagree a bit with uh, Robert here. I think we actually need to use the modern mathematics that economics has actually kept out of, of, of itself when it's taken over most of the other disciplines. So if you look at Minsky's fundamental insight, he saw capitalism being inherently flawed. And he said that was due to characteristics capitalism must possess it is going to be consistent, or well, the financial system must possess to be consistent with full-scale capitalism. And he said that financial system will both generate signals that induce an accelerated desire to invest and finance that investment. Now, that's a must, that's an imperative. You can't reform that away. And just recently, I've worked through my own model of Minsky, and I've realised I can actually state it as three identities, not as equations and everything else. But these are things which are, if you disagree with them, you might as well disagree with gravity. Okay. The first one says the employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of population growth and growth in labour productivity. That's simply a fact. The second one is the wages share of output will rise if money wage demands exceed the sum of inflation and growth in labour productivity. That's also a fact. Now the th fact that I added to Goodwin's model to generate my model of Minsky was this one. This is why private debt and banking is such an important part of a, a new approach to economics. The private debt to GDP ratio will rise if the rate of growth of private debt exceeds the rate of growth of the economy. Inflation and uh, real growth added together. That's another fact. So you can't reform those away. Now, you also can't understand them in terms of what does that actually mean in terms of a, a system, how will it behave, unless you simulate and use the tools of mathematical analysis. So what you get which would quite surprise me when I first simulated this model, was a period of diminishing and then rising cycles. You'd get a great moderation followed by a great recession, which is what we actually had in the real world. And I had a lot of 
conventional economists accuse me of getting these results and having exponential functions in my model. So what I've done here is put that model together in my software package Minsky using completely linear functions. I've got a linear Phillips curve and a linear investment relationship. And I've also stuffed that particular somehow installed, it went, what's happened? I'll put this damn minus sign over here, pardon me. I was told recently people said Minsky is too hard to use and sometimes <laughs> it even bites me. Like it's bitten me there. I've now got, I think I've got that right, let's see if I can simulate it. And I'm not going to get any cycles at all, so I'm going to stop that and go back to where I've recorded them. Pardon me. Never do things live, Bill Gates once said. Okay. Uh, what you're seeing there, in a technical sense, is called the pomo manville route to chaos. And what it looks like, dynamically, is a, a bouncing process between a line and a curve. And if the line intersects the curve, you get equilibrium. But if you don't, you appear to be reaching equilibrium, and then you explode into crisis, which is what we went through in 2007. And I don't know why that suddenly happened either. I'm being a great time of my computer here. OK, let's go that way. When I add non-linear functions to this, it's just to get more realism. Rather than getting extreme up cycles and down cycles as well, you just get the down cycle we went through in the actual crisis. So what I'm saying is it's possible to emulate the behaviour of the real economy by rebuilding the structures we know the economy includes, rather than having to work from some obscure ideas of individual behaviour, which is where behavioural approaches come from. So this gets us a chance to explain what can't be explained by the conventional wisdom. What I've now done is I've graphed here the employment and inflation data for the last 35 years in America. And if you look at the colours, it starts here, booms out into the stagflationary period, and then we plunge back and, hey, we're heading towards equilibrium. Isn't that wonderful? And then suddenly, what the hell happened? <laughs> well, if you look at it uh, in my model, I get exactly the same dynamics. And of course, in my model, I know what's going on. Because what I'm showing you, there are two dimensions of the system. I'm showing employment versus inflation. But if I tilt these boxes up, I can show you the level of debt as well. <laughs> now you've got an idea of what's actually happening behind those systems. And that's what's left out of the conventional thinking. They're, in effect, they've left gravity out of, the of their model of the universe. So a private debt bubble caused the crisis around the world. And if you take a look at the, the red line is private debt in America. So that's UK I'm doing there. The thing that was ignored by our speaker in the previous session about austerity. The blue line rising public debt occurred after the collapse in the rate of growth of, of government debt, of private debt. And the same thing applied in America, it applies in Spain, and it applies in, in Greece. So again, we're misdiagnosing the problem by having an invalid theory of economics. And we're in a debt deflation, attenuated by what's done by governments. That again is left out of the conventional thinking. We need a theory that can take that into, into, a pro, into account. So we need to have a new paradigm in economics, and the tools exist both in the ancient texts of the non-linear dynamic thinkers we had in economics before they actually knew they were doing it, the Marxes, the Schumpeters, etc. But also, we have that in what's modern complexity. So we need to teach, in the interim, before we get a full paradigm, we need to teach neoclassical economics well. And that means teaching the wards. And there's lots of them, which, of course, they leave off. They, we don't leave them off at Kingston. Teach the non-equilibrium classics. People like Marx, Pike to some extent, Schumpeter, Fischer, Minsky. Because we're going, their insights were the insights into the complex system in which we actually live. You need to teach the existing rival schools, of course, post-Keynesian economics, Austrian economics as well, ecological and feminist. They, we have to expose students to the full range of thought that exists in economics rather than teaching the sanitised nonsense that you get in the mainstream. And there's warts in those areas too. For example, one major weakness in post-Keynesian literature in general, and also Austrian and working as well, is leaving out energy. We don't have energy as part of our model of production. That's nonsense. We have to incorporate that. So there are flaws in our own alternatives as well. And teach the history of economic thought and economic history, both of which have been eliminated, and I've seen that process in my 30 years as an academic. And teach complex systems methods as well. That's what we need to bring in to understand and put this all together. System dynamics and multi-agent modelling. And if you want to do it, come to Kingston. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.